turning in the hymn book, Living, Inspiring Hymns, number 354, 354, Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus, Appreciate him from Chicago. He's one of our executive committee members. He's going to be speaking tonight on believing basics. Lord bless you, Brother Rob, as you speak to us. Hello. Glad to have you all here tonight. And I'd like to thank all the girls for that wonderful dinner we had. And you, you all can feel free to engage in postprandial hypoglycemia and take a nap if you please I'm not a scholar or a preacher or a writer and that's why I'm here to make things as simple as possible and I'm just going to give a little word of exhortation and encouragement tonight it's been nine years since I attended my first DBS meeting and I re recently left the new evangelical church I started going to after I was saved I'd been saved barely a year and knew nothing of church life and politics. I had never gone to church. All I can say is I already knew that the watering down of the Bible, and by extension the gospel, was the biggest issue facing not only the church, but the world. Don't ask me how I knew it, but I knew it as a newly saved man. Maybe it was the Hollywood theatrics I saw on TVN, TBN, and years of hearing hollow preaching from spineless preachers. This issue stands alone as the most important issue in my heart. It is more important than who is elected president. It's more important than an impending World War III. At my first DBS meeting, I was completely just floored with men like Dr. Gomez. He had sacrificed his life to put out an accurate, faithful Spanish Bible, and he suffered terribly for it. All the folks who stand on this issue will experience ridicule and character assassination. These are the last days. And, that, and the most prominent sign of these last days is deception. Churches are now preparing folks for the great falling away to worship the Antichrist. Our only defense from being misled is to be in God's word thoroughly and throughly. I've read a lot of comments des describing the DBS as a group of gray-haired, angry old men. Let me tell you, they have that right. We have something to be angry about. Little children... It is the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Welcome to Hope and Change via 2016. Much has transpired since I spoke in 2009 on Vote for Change. 
We certainly had that. The Lord testifies against those given to change in Proverbs 24:21. My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not with them that are given to change. Who would have believed that we, America, are at the most cr- crucial hour in our country's history? God has given our nation over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. The bulwark of our country upholding law and states' rights, the Constitution, has been effectively rendered null and void. The Federal and Supreme Court have overturned the majority of the people in over 35 states, forcing them to recognize two sodomites as a man and wife, or one and one equals one, or whatever you want to call it. This and that equals them. Something like that. The progressives contend that the conservatives want to move us backward. Well, they have done more so. They have moved us right back to the days of Lot and have done so without shame. Isaiah 3, 9 says, The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin is Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. We are... It's backslidden Israel and worse. We've crossed the Rubicon and there's no turning back. Again, it is as in the days of Noah and Lot. We're told the truth and morality are relative. If that is so, why are liberals so dogmatic? The thoughts and deeds of America has become evil continually. Every evil imagination and lust that dwells in men's heart is there for the taking with no restraint. What happened to that restraint that was prevalent? As respect for the Constitution wanes, the country crumbles. And I said before that an attack on the authority of the Constitution is an attack by proxy on the authority of God, on the Word of God, His words, and His person. Wicked men know that by trampling the Constitution underfoot, it'll be easier to rid themselves of the Bible, their foremost enemy. The surge in popularity in socialism, communism, is by its nature against the authority of the Bible because socialism is atheistic at its root. Nikolai Lenin, the founder of the Communist Party in Russia, said, Our program necessarily includes the propaganda of atheism. Isn't that right, Dr. Boyce? The mainstream media, in all its varieties, is pushing secularism, pluralism, and atheism continually. The propagation of communism necessitates the abolition of all religion except the worship of the state. Lenin further said, every religious idea, every idea of God, even every flirtation with the idea of God is unutterable vileness. Frederick Engels, Marx's greatest personal supporter and co-author with Marx in the Communist Manifesto, stated, The last vestige of a creator external to the world is obliterated. When Engels took his last breath, he realized the fact that he obliterated nothing but his own soul. The proponents of atheism tell us clearly who they are at war with. The Russian Encyclopedia lists Quote, God, a mythical invented being. Communism is not incompatible with belief in God. It arose and developed in an acute and constant struggle with religion. The atheist replaces God with his own loathsome, delusional self. Karl Marx stated that we should recognize as the highest divinity the human self-consciousness itself. And of course, there are only a very few who are enlightened to the highest divinity, and these elite consist of those chosen to run the state to which every person must bow. This all sounds like a lot of America, what's developing today. Their ideology is antithesis to the law of liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The First Amendment of the Constitution that protects our freedom to practice and proclaim it, that states Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, has been twisted and obscured into a subjective maze. 
and our right to exercise our faith that freely is going, going, and soon to be gone. We can add this meeting here now, but those of us who have understanding of the times know we will soon be forced to meet in a not-so-public environment. Persecution is coming for those who live godly. By the Lord's grace, may we be ready for it and able to stand even unto death. As respect for God's word diminishes, anarchy reigns. Habakkuk 1.4 says, Therefore the law is slack. And judgment doth but never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Respect for God's authority has been diminished as proclaiming Christians have joined in mass the ranks of those given to change. This is no surprise as Scripture tells us that they shall turn their ears away from the truth and shall be turned to fables. They are not satisfied with God's settled word in English, the King James Bible. God's light has been dimmed in this once blessed nation. When we have had the light and turned from it, a judicial blindness becomes our affliction. We are following in the steps of disobedient Israel, as the Lord warned in Deuteronomy 28:29. And thou shalt grope at noonday, as the blind gropeth in darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. And thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. And no man shall save thee. Donald Trump's not going to save us. Not anyone. Only a turning to the Lord through his obedience of his words will we see true hope and change. This blindness is manifest in the elevation of evil deeds that once happened rarely, but now is so prevalent every day, everywhere. And the most important thing that we must be sure of in this dark hour is, number one, we must be genuinely born again and saved. And I hope everyone here has this settled in their heart. Unless we as believers are in the resurrected Christ, and the resurrected Christ is in the believer, Christ in you, the hope of glory, then understanding the Bible version issue and all the words and doctrines that are added, subtracted, and changed is of no importance. If any of you are 100% sure in this department, get it settled today, and we do have many good pastors here. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Belief is important, but belief must be accompanied by faith. There are many who believe, but are lacking faith. Hebrews 4.2 says, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. We must have a sound testimony of believing with all our being and our faith must be accompanied by the power of God in the Holy Ghost as the Thessalonians. In First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.5 For our gospel came not unto you in word only but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And in First Thessalonians 2.13 the Apostle Paul continues, For this cause also we thank, thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Salvation is a work of God for man, and not a work of man for God. Dr. Edward Freer Hills, a great defender of the faith, and when we speak of that of the faith, that being the body of doctrine and all God's words contained in the canon of Scripture, Dr. Hills stated in his books Believing Bible Study and the King James Version defended the difference between believing and doubting. And I heard this from Dr. Barnett watching a video of the DBS meeting from many years ago. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith... It is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If I truly believe in God, 
then God is more real to me than anything else I know, more real even than my faith in him. For if anything else is more real to me than God himself, then I am not believing but doubting. I am real, my experiences are real, my faith is real, but God is more real. Otherwise, I am not believing but doubting. I cast myself therefore on that which is most real, namely God himself. I take God and Jesus Christ his Son as a starting point of all my thinking. May the Lord help us all to do exactly this. The Lord directs us in his word where to find the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalm 47 and Hebrews 10:7, it states, Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. The scriptures from Genesis to Revelation is the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm amazed at where some folks tell me they have found Jesus. At AA, in a dream, in the Roman Catholic Mass. For God and Jesus Christ to be the starting point of all our thinking, the Bible will have the preeminent position in our lives. We must be, be armed, endeavor to be armed with the scriptures day and night. In Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. The best advice I ever had was to read the Bible through at least once a year by this man. Eighty-five verses a day in your King James Bible will get you through the Bible in one year. Reading all the Bible is most important is most important so we do not neglect any part of it. This will give us strength in our faith and our love for the Lord Jesus Christ will grow. After we are armed with genuine faith, Dr. Hills tells us how to stand on it. How do we take our stand upon divine revelation? Only in one way, namely through the logic of faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Since this gospel is true, these conclusions logically follow. First, the Bible is God's infallibly inspired word. This must be so because if our salvation depends on our believing in Christ, then surely God must have left left us an infallible record telling us who Jesus Christ is and how we may believe in him truly and savingly. Second, the Bible has been preserved down through the ages by God's special providence. This also must be so, because if God has inspired the Holy Scriptures infallibly, then surely it is not left to their survival the chance to chance, but has preserved them providentially down through the centuries. Third, the text found in the majority of the biblical manuscripts is is the providentially preserved text. This too must be true, because if God has preserved the scriptures down through the ages for the salvation of men and the edification and comfort of his church, then he must have preserved them not secretly in holes and caves, but in a public way in the usage of his church. Hence, the text found in the majority of biblical manuscripts is the true providentially preserved text. And by the way, the received text underlying underlying the King James Bible consists of over 99% of the majority according to the 1967 statistics by Kurt Alon. Out of 5,255 manuscripts, this is 1967 count, there's more now, 5,210 are of the received text line. Only 45 are the Gnostic critical text. By a computer stat, that equals 99.14% majority. And continuing here, fourth, the providential preservation of the scriptures did not cease with the invention of printing. For why would God's special providential care be operative at one time and not at another time? Before the invention of the printing, but not after it. 
Hence, the first printed texts of the Old and New Testament scriptures were published under the guidance of God's special providence. Thus, when we believe in Christ, the logic of our faith leads us to the true text of Holy Scripture, namely, the Masoretic Hebrew text, the Textus Receptus, and the King James Version, and other faithful translations. It is on this text, therefore, that we take our stand and endeavor to build a consistently Christian apologetic system. Unquote. Our stand, our apologetic, our answer, our defense, is spelled out for us in Jude 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Once delivered and forever preserved. I was led by the logic of faith ten years ago to my conviction of God's preserved words in English being the King James Bible. I literally walked to a church the Sunday after I got saved in my bedroom and had a King James Bible in my hand. I turned out to be the only one that did such. They were reading from the NIV. So it was only a few Sundays before I was hit with a major discrepancy between my Bible and the version they were using in the pulpit. Of course, I had already noticed many discrepancies. We were in 1 Samuel 6, the return of the ark from the Philistines in the new cart pulled by the milk kind, lowing as they went. And the ark came to Beth Shemesh. In verse 19 in my King James Bible, it said, And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people fifty thousand and threescore and ten men. That's fifty thousand and seventy. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. In the NIV that he was preaching from, the great slaughter was reduced to, reduced to a heavy blow of seventy men. So I said to myself, hmm, 50,070 or 70? So I asked the pastor about the discrepancy, and he said something about scribal errors. Well, it just so happened around that same time that I was reading a book by David Cloud called The Bible Version Issue. I was convinced the, the King James Bible was God's preserved words in English after reading only the introduction in the first chapter. My conviction came from the internal truths of scripture, of the scriptures, the many verses on Bible preservation. I followed the logic of faith of God's immutable promise by his word of my recent salvation, that it was true. So logically, the King James Bible was true and trustworthy, 100%, and of course, the King James Bible is right, always and always. I knew God was not a liar and not the author of confusion. At that time, I did not look up the commentaries on the discrepancy in this verse, but I later, later learned that many of the commentaries follow the scholars in going with the 70. They say that Beshemeth was too small a village to employ 57,070. If they would have searched the scriptures, they would have read in Joshua 21.16 and 1 Chronicles 6.59 that the large number was feasible. They came from Beth Shemesh suburbs. Yes, the King James Bible is correct always, and you can bet your salvation on it. The problem with the modern versions is their roots are from unbelief with no faith. Yea, hath God said, is their life verse. They don't believe God has preserved his words. Their own statements reveal their, their unbelief. And their mission is to recover the words that God lost. The effects of this theory being taught for over a century in schools and universities have created a terrible state of confusion in churches and throughout all society that has grown worse and worse. As the churches go, so goes the country. 
If we can't be sure of absolute truth, if words and sentences are constantly contested, people grow more and more uncertain, and moral relativism and subjectivism rules the day. We have recently gone from a president who did not have sex with that girl to a president who has reinvented our whole history into a pluralistic quasi-Muslim experience. The most tragic consequence is our children. The last verse in the Old Testament, Malachi 4.6, And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. The curse we are experiencing today is, is among our children. We have rejected the truth, and the effects are manifest in our children today. The Lord says in Hosea 4.6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no, be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. The crime rate of violence among children, children killing their parents, and the, and the crime rate, sexual activity, and diseases that follow in preteens have skyrocketed. What we are teaching them in school would have gotten folks thrown in jail years ago. We are self-destructing from within. And now the barba barbarians have entered the gates. When I pass out tracts to young folks, and I often quote John 3.16, more often than, that, than not now, they tell me they have never heard this verse. And we just talked about that. I think uh, Brother Brian said something about that. Of course, the modern versions have changed John 3.16 also. What we have to remember and stress that the Bible version is a text issue. The King James Bible is from the proper, providentially preserved Hebrew and Greek texts or words that were, number one, settled in heaven. Psalm 119, 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Number two. These settled words were sent down to earth. Psalm 57, 3. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Number three, these words were sent and given to his people, the Jews, to copy down. Romans 3, 2, and unto them, the Jews, were committed the oracles of God. And number four, under the Lord's superintendence, he has providentially preserved these very words up to this very day and on into the future. Psalm 12, 6 and 7, and we all, all should know this now. The words of the Lord are pure words. The silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this day forever. The modern textual critics and scholars will deny there are verses that explicitly state the pre preservation of God's words. That is false. I hope that you folks know some of the dozens or hundreds of verses that explicitly state that God will preserve his words, such as the threefold, threefold prophecy by the Lord Jesus Christ, stated in Matthew 24.35, Mark 13.31, and Luke 21.23. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. In contradistinction to God's settled words in English, the King James Bible, and its underlying Hebrew and Greek words, the ever-changing words of the modern versions and their underlying Hebrew and Greek words are not settled. Their text is an unstable, evolutionary text that is constantly being updated. The text underlying the modern versions, called the Nesalalan United Bible Society, NAUBS text, is now in its 27th edition. In the 24th edition of the NAUBS, it claims it's exactly that, that it is an ev evolutionary text. It reads, quote, It should naturally be understood that this text is a working 
a working text, that's an evolutionary text, in the sense of this century-long Nestle tradition, or Nestle, whatever you want to call them, it is not considered to be definitive, but is a stimulus to further efforts towards redefining and verifying the text of the New Testament. Does that sound like a settled text to you? Here it is called a working text. Working means the process of shaping a material, the working of clay. It's easy when it's damp. It's malleable, easy to change. That is the exact opposite of a settled text, fixed or resolved definitely and conclusively. Also, the settled words of God are a contract, a non-negotiable settled contract Every word, jot, tittle, established forever. Ecclesiastes 3.14 says it. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. When we have a proper fear of the Lord, we have no problem understanding and believing his words. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Lewis Ferry Chafer said, The word of God thus becomes a title deed to eternal life, and it should be treated as an article of surety, for God cannot fail in any word he has spoken. Unquote. In Hebrews 9, this book is described as the last will and testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. A will or testament is a, bind, a, a binding, immutable contract. Hebrews 9, 15 and 20, and you should mark this in your Bible. And for this cause, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all why the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. And in Exodus 24, 8, And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you, and get this, concerning all these words. This book, consisting of all these words, was ratified with the blood of Jesus Christ, typified by Moses sprinkling it. Our job as kings and priests are to keep these words. The Lord Jesus said in John 14:15, If you love me, keep my commandments. To keep is to obey, guard, protect, and proclaim all these words in English and the underlying Hebrew and Greek words. That is what we endeavor to teach you here at these DBS meetings. It is incumbent on every believer to keep these words, the whole Bible, Old and New Testament. All these words are the, are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 16:13 and 14, it says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, the Lord Jesus Christ, for he shall receive of mine Jesus' words, and shall show it unto you. We as priests of God are to receive these words by faith and keep them, obey, guard, and protect them. And in John 14, 23, 24, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. 
He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These words of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he received of the Father, were received by the apostles. John 17, 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have surely known that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. And they were written down of the, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Second Peter 1.21 For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The, the human authors of the critical texts from Griesbach, Lachman, Tischendorf, to Westcott and Hort, to Nida, Nessel, Allen and Metzger, and recently Dan Wallace have a problem with this. Second Peter 1.20 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. All these men have a problem with that, and all these men have departed from the faith and followed cunningly devised fables and interjected their private interpretation, heresy, into the text. The definition of heresy, given at a previous DBS meeting years ago by Brother David Hollywood, and he looks like he left, says, quote, The denial of a scheme wholesale is not heresy and has not the creative power of a heresy. It is of the essence of heresy that it leaves standing a great part of the structure it attacks. On this account, it can appeal to believers and continues to affect their lives through deflecting them from their original characters. Wherefore, it is said of heresies that they survive by the truths they retain. Remember, the serpent was more subtle than any beast in the garden. We are in a constant battle to make known these heresies that are hidden beside the truth. Many in the church tell us, don't be negative. Just be known for what you believe, not for what you are against. Well, we are commanded to be negative and expose and excise these heresies. We're to be, as in Ephesians 5, 10 through 13, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That includes all modern perversions, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. We reprove these perversions with God's light standard, the King James Bible. All modern versions compare themselves with the King James Bible, saying their version is an improvement. Hogwash. If theirs is so much better, why do they leave a blank in Acts 8.37 and other omitted versions? Why don't they renumber their so-called Bible? The basis of modern versions is on an uninspired Gnostic false text, and the modern version scholars believe that and admit it. An example we can look at, and if you'd like to turn there, Matthew 1.7-8, and Solomon begot Reboam, and Reboam begot Abiah, and Abiah begot Asa, and Asa begot Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Ozias. And now I'll read this in the highly touted scholarly ESV. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, and, of, and Abijah, the father of Asaph, and Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat. Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat? Asaph is not in the Lord's genealogy anywhere. Why did the ESV put that obvious error in? Even, even the NIV used the correct name, Asa. The ESV followed the scholars who followed the oldest and best manuscripts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, the two darling Gnostic false Greek manuscripts. Bruce Metzger, commenting on his book and textual commentary on the Greek New Testament, said, 
The evangelist may have derived material for the genealogy, not from the Old Testament directly, but from subsequent genealogical lists in which erroneous spelling occurred. Metzger believes the evangelist Matthew made a mistake under the, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And the same mistake is also made in Matthew 1.10. What do I got, a minute? Two minutes? In Matthew 1.10, he repeats the same mistake. The King James Bible reads, And Ezekias begat Manassas. Manassas begot Amon. And Amon begot Josias. In the ESV, it says, And Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos. And Amos, the father of Josiah. Again, the ESV followed the scholars and the oldest and best manuscripts. Metzger states, The textual evidence for the reading Amos, an error for Amon, the name of the king of Judah, is nearly the same as that which reads Asaph in verses 7 and 8. This moves beyond the definition of heresy, this is from the edit editor of the Greek Testament, which underlies all the modern perversions and is taught in seminaries and Bible colleges throughout the countries. We are in the last days, folks, but we know evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And I'll just finish up with a statement, another statement by uh, Brother Hills. In regard to Bible versions, Many contemporary Christians are behaving like spoiled and rebellious children. They want a Bible version that pleases them, no matter whether it pleases God or not. We want a Bible version in our own idiom, they clamor. We want a Bible that talks to us the same way in which we talk to our friends over the telephone. We want an informal God, no better educated than ourselves, with a limited vocabulary and a taste for modern slang. And having thus registered their preference, they go in their several ways. Some of them unite with the modernists using the RSV or the NEB. Others deem the NASV or the NIV more evangelical. Still others opt for the TEV or the Living Bible. And they do not stop there. More and more, the trend, is, the trend is to do without the scriptures altogether and to rely on gospel music, Christian films, tapes, counseling, and psychology to do the work that only the Bible can do. But God is bigger than you are, dear friend, and the Bible version which you m must use is not a matter for you to decide according to your whims and prejudices. It has already been decided for you by the workings of God's special providence. Amen to that. And we'll now read uh, in Psalm 119, verse 33. And if you folks would stand and read along with me, please. Psalm 119 starting in verse 33 to 40. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies, and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in the way. Establish thy word unto thy servant, who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach which I fear, for thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Amen to the region. Thank you, Rob. Will you may be seated. Let's turn again to our... Uh, our hymn, and we're going to have an offering after the hymn. What is the number, man? 323? 323. All right, 323. Thank you, Rob. Very good. 323. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. What?
have, John? Okay, John and Jacob, you come and uh, uh, our, take our plates over there. And John, I want you to lead us in a word of prayer before the passing of the offering. This will go to the Dean Burgon Society and whatever is necessary for the church to help out the church and the expenses will go for that. So, John, we'll lead, it, lead us if you would, please. Father, we thank you for the Dean Burgon Society. We thank you for Dr. Waite and, and, and the other speakers that are here this, uh, during this conference today and tomorrow for, the, for their um, ability to study your word, Lord, and bring forth these messages. Lord, we know that so much of the world does not understand that uh, it is about the actual text of the Bible that matters. It's not what translation, it's, it's the underlying text behind it in that you gave your word to us it's directly from you, and we want to get it as best as we possibly can to the word as you gave it to us in the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Father, we ask for a blessing upon this offering tonight, Lord, and for the, the continuation of the, of the speakers tonight and tomorrow, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Questions? We have a, write us questions at BFTBC. Dot org. Questions at BFTBC.org. We received about 15 questions. We heard from Pastor Daniel Waite. Uh, uh, I thank you so much. This, rather, this is from CenturyLink Customer. I thank you for 1999 when we found the Bible for Day Baptist Church and the DBS. Rick and Wendy Kosick have learned so much. This is from Wendy Kosick under these teachings and their research in the Bible issue. Thank you for all of you who stand on the right Bible, King James Bible, and have taken a hit for it. May our Lord Jesus Christ keep you in his perfect word. Thank you, Rob, for your wonderful topic. I'm glad that the Lord has given you such a good friendship. And then we've heard also from a CenturyLink customer. I'm still uh, listening to you on YouTube. Uh, listening, but I missed some of it too. Uh, what I have seen on YouTube, I've been very good. No going off. I hope you'll all be have a good dinner. That's uh, from this person. And then uh, Randy Houdishell from Canada. Randy and Anne Marie Houdishell. Uh, since the Sinai Vatican manuscripts are claimed by supposedly learned men to be superior to the underlying text of the King James Bible, how do these Gnostic texts compare with each other? For example, how many changes were necessary to get them even to match so that they could be uh, blended into a final result, so to speak? Any changes certainly would seem to be impossible to call those documents the unchanging Word of God. Thanks, Randy. We're watching from Canada. Appreciate it for the presentation today. Well, as someone has said in uh, Sinai and, Man and uh, Vatican manuscripts alone, in the Gospels alone, over 3,000 differences, so they're not all unified at all. Then Pastor Dan Waite, uh, he's had some information, the sermon audio, 65 total people have tuned in so far at some point, with eight being the most watched at a single time. The BFT Bible for Day Baptist Church Live, 10 for the USA, two from Australia, one from Brazil have been listening to us. YouTube observed a high of 11 viewers, and uh, we estimate that between 30 to 50 viewers were watching. That's from the tech people. And then uh, we heard from Julie Monahan. She was here five years ago. I haven't heard from her for a while, but because of the Dean Bergen signing meeting and, be, uh, and so on, the good things you said, she's going to be returning to our church. Hasn't been here for quite a few years. And uh, she's back on her email list, and she wrote us, listening to the DBS meetings online. She called me. In fact, tonight we talked to her. Listening to the meeting online, the messages have been interesting, informative, and encouraging. Audio and video both seem to be working well now. Looking forward to the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Julie Monahan uh, from Pennsylvania. All right, that's, that's fine. Now, we want to have a time for questions and answers. And uh, we want to take the first question. For the very first time, let's, Joshua Lee, I've asked him for five minutes. He's going to tell you about his Chinese Bible. His Chinese Bible. Uh, Brother John, if you could pass these out. don't have enough for everybody, but at least you have for some. Uh, I don't know how he's going to cover these pages in five minutes, but he's going to try. Chinese Bible is ad ac accurate and follows the Texas Receptus and so on. He's coming up very slow from China. It takes a while to come up here, but he gets he's coming. Come right up. Uh, well, okay, come right up here. Okay. Joshua Lee. We've known him for quite a few years, and he's a Korean, but he's working on the Chinese Bible. I'll figure that one out. Okay. It's going to take five. Uh, 
Joshua Lee speaking. Uh, I just spent a lot of time in the China translating from King James Bible to the Chinese Bible. Because why? Now, 7,000 Chinese underground people believe God, but they don't have right Bible, Union Bible, Liberal Bible. So now I just translate with uh, uh, Hong Kong Ten family, uh, Chinese people, because of that uh, Hong Kong people, they understood that King James English, and uh, they speak Chinese perfectly. So now we are making him uh, translate uh, almost done. So I just brief five minutes. So you, you did you see that uh, uh, printing material? Yes. First one, uh, top line, C K J V dot Asia slash. Uh, CKJV dot uh, I don't know on the other line and Shangti on the line SC. That means you can see that address. You can see the our jobs. How we do it. Okay. Now just a little short brief about Chinese Bible. Uh, now everybody using U Union Bible. That you understand that Union Bible, Union Chinese Bible means like a NIV Bible, West Court and Hold Text, Catholic Bible. Okay, so have to change them. Uh, that the uh, email address you can get in there. You can helping them because they understand the English. They, so uh, please that get it in that uh, address. First one, Colossians chapter one, verse fourteen. Right? That King James Bible redemption through His blood. There, right? Chinese Bible nothing there. Redemption is through the G Jesus Christ blood, otherwise cannot redeem. Amen? Amen? Yes. Very important word. So, you can see in the bottom, we just put it in. Tad, she, that, that, uh, that Chinese uh, uh, pronunciation. Right? You understand, right? Not, not, not necessary to uh, explain. Okay. Second column, Romans chapter 5, 15 and 16. That uh, salvation is a free gift. Amen? Free gift, not to labor, not to uh, religion act, nothing else. Just free gift, our God. But they are just, they don't like it that way. They are free, they took out that free means. That Bible is a religion, religion Bible. So adding it and correct it. Now, John chapter 1, 18, as you know that the only begotten Son, very important word, only, 
the only begotten son. But now, modern Bible, no more begotten. Just the only one son. Hmm? Okay. So, put it in. And uh, Mark chapter, uh, skip it. Let's go. Psalm chapter 9, King James Bible, the wicked shall be turned into hell. But Chinese Bible, no hell. No hell. So, just to put it in. Uh, Psalm chapter 80, 83, 18. Modern Bible, no God's name, Jehovah. No God's name. But, King James Bible only, Jehovah, there. They said, whose name? Okay. Oh, already? Oh, yes, wow, okay. Alone is Jehovah. The most high of all the earth. Genesis chapter 24, verse 22, modern Bible, nose rings. So, my children wearing the nose ring, that allowed. But King James Bible, no, earring. So, change it. Oh, the last one. Isaiah fourteen twelve. Oh, Lucifer! Satan's call Lucifer. But modern Bible, Chinese Bible, no Lucifer. So just to put in correct Lucifer. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, Brother Joshua Lee. We appreciate that. Hope that we'll do well on the Chinese Bible. It's available in the New Testament, and he's working on the Old Testament as well. All right, we're time for questions and answers now. Uh, if you have a question, come to the microphone on this side or that side and ask it. There's one question that came this morning uh, that it wasn't asked publicly, but what's the difference between the, the Cambridge University Press Bible text and the Oxford text? Those are two texts that were printed in England to start with in 1617 or 1676, uh, 1976, whatever the date of it was. And when they printed those Bibles, King James Bibles, they both had a, a sort of a copyright in England called cum privilegio. Cum privilegio means with privilege. And when they came over to this country, the publishers did not want to rest, uh, respect that copyright, and so they can do anything they want to change it and so on. But those two Bibles, with privilege, uh, Cambridge is what our defined King James Bible is based upon. That's accurate. The Oxford University Press has about 125, 150 changes that are wrong, so we go with the Cambridge rather than the Oxford. But uh, these are some of the things that we uh, have a question about. So our defined King James Bible is the Oxford, or excuse me, the Cambridge University Press, and so that's where we go. All right, we're time for questions and answers. Uh, we have it in our uh, document here from 7.55 to 8.15. So we have 15 minutes of question and answer. So who's the first questioner? Come right up to the microphone and ask it, and then those brethren who are the Executive Committee, Advisory Council, want to answer, we'll let you answer. Go right ahead. Paul's got a question.
the two main Bibles today, like we start like in Genesis and then go to the New Testament, like in the book of Matthew and everything else. Uh, I mean to do that. I mean, how, how, how would I start that? Okay, the question is how do we work with 85 verses per day? Uh, years ago, my father in law, future father in law, said uh, he didn't know how to read the Bible through in a year. Our pastor, when I was first saved on New Year's Eve, said, Now, you people in Berea, Ohio, Berea Baptist Church, I want every one of you to read the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, this coming year. And I asked my future father in law, How do you do that, Dad? The future used to be there. We will be there. I don't know. So I took the Bible that uh, Uncle Charlie Allen gave me, the high school janitor that led me to Christ. In that Bible, there's every one of the books of the Bible, how many chapters, how many verses, through the Old Testament, New Testament. There's about 31,000 verses in the whole Bible. So I divided that by 356 uh, days in the year, came up with 85 verses per day. If we read 85 certain verses per day, it takes you through the whole Bible in a year. I've been doing that ever since I've been saved. At the age of 16, first time, the first few years, I read it twice a year. But right on there, you say, well, why do I waste my time doing that? If I read it once, isn't that the end? No. I was saved back in 1944, and this is 19, what, 2016. So you see how many times I've been reading that Bible. I don't know all of it, but at least I do my best. So, uh, Paul, that's basically what to do. Start with where you are today. This is the 27th of July. I would just suggest you get that Bible reading schedule. Start with the 27th of July and read that 85 verses. Then tomorrow is the 28th. Read those 85. And then start right where you are to get through it. Ask the Lord to help you understand. Okay, yes, sir. Other next question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Paul, it goes to our services. Now, sure. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. My name is Jack Whitener, and uh, it's not so much a question as it is a, a, a charge to the, to the men of the, of the Dean Bergen Society. Mm-hmm. But my church down in Newark, Delaware, has had a recently a great episode in where our, our pastor is not, been, not advocating for the King James only or only King James. He's he's a graduate of Bob Jones University, and he received the the the, uh, the church congregation to believe he was King James, and now he's not anymore. And, and we need to have some kind of uh, strategy to counteract this, to be proactive in educating members of churches that could be brought under the same kind of, of uh, pressures that I had and other people in our church. In other words, how do we defend or how do we guard against a rogue pastor who's believing something that the congregation has set up in the Constitution to be not legal or not wanted in the church? So I would like to charge you with the idea of putting together Mm-hmm. Thoughts around that issue, a packet of, of, mm-hmm. of uh, resources, or, or what to do to let the people in the churches know about the cause, the, uh, the oh. dangers in going into the modern Bible. All right, thank you very much, brethren. Who wants to answer that? DBS man, executive committee, advisory council, step to the microphones and speak up. Yes, sir. Uh, Executive committee member. Uh, This is a very common problem. Uh, In the years that I have uh, been aware of the textual problem at Bob Jones University, and uh, they're free to do whatever they choose to do, of course, but uh, I wish they'd be honest. Amen. Because uh, at first we had some missionaries in it that we supported, mm-hmm. and we found out when they got the, to the uh, field they used uh, other versions. And uh, when I contacted them, they didn't want to even be honest about that. Uh, and they were dishonest when they presented their ministry in the church. Yes. They told us how much they loved the King James Bible. Nah. 
<laughs> and uh, it's like a man, you know, that says, I love my wife, but I, this other one over here is good, too, and I want to be living with her. Mm-hmm. Now, that's essentially what it is. And so uh, they, they should be held accountable for misleading churches. Now, what I, what I would suggest, and this is only a suggestion, having had to deal with it many times. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would pray sincerely and honestly uh, for the Lord's direction. But if the church has clear uh, statements of what they support and what they tolerate, then the church needs to uh, deal with Him through the uh, leaders of the church and hold Him accountable and if he doesn't uh, relent and in good faith and in good spirit uh, return to the wishes of the church and the text issue, uh, give him a United States map and tell him he is free to go. Amen. Another, thank you, very good. Uh, another, another answer. Some of you brethren, executive ready, advisory council? Anyone else? That's a good answer. Yes. Brother John. Yeah, John Watkins, uh, North Baptist Church. Um, right the council member, and I agree. Uh, uh, John, pull right in the mic so I can try. I agree with what our brother said. You know, it is a tough issue for churches to deal with, and really it's, it's something that has to be dealt with when you have a pastor that comes under false pretenses, which what it, is what it right. is. The leadership in that church, I mean, the, the deacons need to uh, stand up and... and confront this pastor on this issue and ultimately the, the bottom line is if he doesn't uh, fall in line with where the church is wants to be then he needs to be dismissed you know it's, it's, it's not something that's pleasant to do but it's what has to be done and we're, we live in a world where it's so easy to compromise he should and be what? what did you say he should be what? we live, we live in a world where it's so easy yeah. to compromise and we can't compromise on this issue at all what did you say he should be what? the pastor what? dismissed Dismissed. Well, he has to be dismissed. Amen. He's not going to uh, stick with the King James, and that's where, right. the, where that where that particular church in question is, is is in support of the King James Bible and its underlying text. Some of the some of the pastors that have been uh, uh, pastoring for years probably can give some better uh, answer than I can. So I'm just a deacon. Good. But, Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Yes, uh, Dr. DeVitro, Executive Committee Member, DBS, and Vice President. I, I'm going to sound a little mean. That's all right. Go ahead. Be mean. I don't think he'll relent. I don't either. He, he'll just go underground. He's still going to correct him and change the Bible even if he yes. uses King James Bible. Yes. He lied to get in the Bible. Then that sin would be before all. Yes. Any other comments on that? Uh, let me simply say and agree with that. A pastor that goes into a church that says we stand in our constitution for the King James Bible, he comes in, he's a liar, he's a cheat, he's a scoundrel, he's a devil and a demon. Anybody that lies about the Bible should be not even brought in. Once he's in, he changes the Bible, the church should vote him out, I agree with you. Dismiss him instantly and amazingly. Bob Jones University fellows are that way. I've had many different instances of that. It's not the first time. Many different local churches. They come in there, it's in the Constitution. We stand for the King James Bible. He comes in there lying through his teeth. Oh, I agree with it. A few more years, a few more months, change of the Bible. Boot him out, get him out, and write the Bob Jones University and say, why do, you, why do you produce liars? I've got three of my sons, graduates of Bob Jones. I know what they stand for. Now, every one of our sons and children came out with the King James Bible. Uh, in fact, one of my sons, uh, Pastor Dan, our youngest boy, he was going to another school, Pensacola, and he had a computer and, uh, and an email and different things, and they didn't want that in there. So uh, he left there. So he went to Bob Jones. I wrote to Bob Jones, Jr., who was the pastor, the president at that time. I said, you know our position on the King James Bible. Well, my son, Pastor Daniel, may have any problems going to your school. He said, no problems. So he went there, came out, King James Bible. We got that straight, but there's lots of Bob Jones graduates that are infiltrating our churches, changing the King James Bible churches to Gnostic critical Greek texts. I'm ashamed of them. It's dastardly deep. It's dishonest. 
I don't have any big words to say about it. It's devilish. Other questions you may have. We have four more minutes. Or other comments. Pastor Dan. Follow up on that with that previous question. I think it's important for us to uh, let's train the people. Uh, Bill uh, Shepherd, he called about a thousand people, mm-hmm. a thousand churches, a thousand, a thousand people, a thousand churches, kind of a combination of both. Mm-hmm. And he counted a couple of churches that, that the pastor was there and they, he, they said, we don't understand the King James anymore. Clearly, at one point they did. Mm-hmm. Because the source I got there, the phone number was, was to. Um, it was indicated that they were working with the King James Bible. You see, the, the, the pastor came in there in the reception, but the people weren't, weren't important enough to know the difference. So in order to avoid this, you know, we, we have to inform the people, teach the people mm-hmm. of the need and the differences between the Gnostic stream of texts and the text receptus. Amen. Any other comments on that or any other questions? We have three minutes. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Jack. I don't, I don't want to give the impression that you're not doing your job. I'm, but we need a lot of help. The memberships of a lot of churches, people don't know what to say about the King James. And we just need to reach the people better all the time. And we can't give up. So I want to encourage you for your stands. I'm not blaming, but it was done underhandedly with our pastor, and yet the people of the church like him. He's a very likable fellow, but yet he's not hes not being real, and so we have that to fight against, and, and I just uh, welcome your prayers All right. for, for us down in, uh, in Newark, Delaware for this situation. Oh, boy, thank but please be encouraged. I thank you for what you stand thank for. Thank you very much. And another thing, Bill's going to talk about another thing. If the pastor comes into a church for the King James Bible, you stand firmly for the King James Bible, he continues to change the version, get out of the church. Go to some other church that stands for the King James Bible. All right, Bill, go ahead. have about uh, two more minutes. Okay. We, uh, we have a lot of problems in churches that are weak on the King James Bible. Yes. Uh, many of them, uh, when the pastor gets the message about a Dean Burgon Society meeting, he doesn't share that information with the people in his church. Mm-hmm. Uh, that has got to change. Yes. And I've been encouraging uh, the secretaries in some of these churches to spread the information. It's not just for the pastor. Anybody in the church can come to these meetings. So it's important for them to come. It's important for them to learn Mm -hmm. about the differences uh, between the King James Bible and the modern translations of the Bible. But we can't expect our pastors to uh, do all of the work for us. Mm -hmm. We, as church members, have to study the issues. We have to become aware of it. And we have to communicate that information to the pastor. Plus, we need to educate newer people who are coming into the church. Mm -hmm. And as we talk to people outside of the church, we need to educate them as well. Make it known that you preach the word in the church and you preach uh, from the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. People have to know this. If we don't Mm -hmm. educate them, the pastors are not strong enough to do it by themselves. Okay, thank you, Bill. Uh, Pastor Spencer wants to invite everyone at the conclusion of the night's meeting, go back in the very back, and the ladies have some refreshments. Pastor Spencer, what other refreshments back there? Uh, I'm sure oh, okay. Hey, but anyway, some refreshments, we invite you all to go back there. After the meeting. Okay. All right, well, our time is ready for our next speaker, our final speaker of the evening. I want to invite him to come up here. Pastor Kenneth Rainey, one of our executive committee members from uh, from uh, South Carolina, Greenville, South Carolina, is going to be speaking on redeeming faith must be based on truth. May the Lord bless you. Pastor Rainey. God bless. Well, it's good to be here, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. And... Uh, how many of you's back hurts as bad as mine right about now? Let me see. Uh, well, I'm not alone. I see that. And um, 
My, uh, I'm with you. Uh, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, I want to read a passage of Scripture with you before, uh, at, at the beginning of the message. And if you have a Bible and can reach it, and uh, if you feel like it and you're able, I don't want you to do something that will make you worse than you are. But if you can stand, uh, it would be good. And uh, turn with us, please, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And I want to begin reading there at verse 6. Romans 10, 6 through 18. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth, not the head now, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him uh, shall not be ashamed. For well, there is no difference between Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is over all, over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not uh, believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, uh, that's, uh, yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the end of the world. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon your word. As we look into it and as we bring a message, we pray, Lord, it will honor you and people will be edified and that the church will be strengthened. For Jesus' sake, amen. Thank you. Be seated. And uh, I want to bring you a message that is uh, in large part a testimony, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. And uh, if it is, then I will go away happy. Entitled, and I have to read the title because I changed the title of something a, a dozen times. Redeeming faith must have truth as its basis. Now, I'll tell you something. Uh, we have to preach the absolute truth. And uh, when we preach the truth, then we've done all we can do. If people believe it, they'll be saved. If they don't believe it, they'll reject it. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Bible says that uh, the Lord Jesus is the Word. He said, I am the way, the truth. And, you know, I believe that with all my heart. The way, the truth, and the life. And so, without those three things... Uh, And if you take away the word, if you take away the truth, then uh, the gospel is weakened and becomes impotent. And uh, the devil wins and people lose and and the Lord is uh, 
very seriously offended uh, in that. And so I want to bring you a message that I hope will be a, a help to you uh, in these days. Now this is a, a defense of the accurately translated uh, words of the God-preserved received text into the English language of the authorized King James or authorized version. And after long years of reading what God says about his promises to preserve his words of truth to men, and many scholarly works pro and con on the subject, uh, dealing with the subject of Bible preservation, I have un I'm coming in unapologetic uh, uh, declaration that I have reached a convinced position upon this vital subject. I have reached a decision. I'm going to be accountable for my decision, but I have reached a decision after reading it and reading it and reading what men say and what has been said and what is being said under God and by the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God, not some teacher, I have come to a decision that God has preserved the King James Bible in truth in a good and reliable text that I can base my hope and eternity in all respects in that text and in the God that gave it. And so I want to share that some of those thoughts today. Now, some fun, uh, formerly fundamental scholars uh, have written that this subject should be left solely in the hands of the scholarly. I'm not a scholarly. Uh, I come from South Carolina. We say is and ain't, tis and, and uh, all that, and, and yep and nope and y'all. And uh, where we hadn't been corrupted, we still speak that part of that kind of English. And I understand those folk, you know. Well, anyway, but uh, I, I dare to have my own conviction on this crucial subject, regardless of what the scholars say. And I ask your indulgence of one who isn't one of the not many wise of 1 Corinthians 1.26. However... I am certain beyond doubt that the authorized King James Bible is the preserved Word of God in the English language. During the invitation at the close of a gospel message of a joint assembly of the junior and intermediate Sunday school departments in October 1955, I trusted Christ as my Savior. I was nine years old. That Sunday was the close was the closing meeting of a two weeks revival. Our pastor brought a gospel message that morning to the assembled children. It was clear, compelling, and a message that had an invitation to it, and it was simple, and it simply asked those who wished to repent of his or her sins to trust Jesus as Savior to come forward and gather in the Sunday school room behind it. I was standing behind two older and taller boys that I. At this time, uh, I know one of them is already dead, and I think my wife and I have discovered in seeing the activity around the home where the other one lived, I think both of them are dead. I was standing behind those two older boys uh, that Sunday morning. I hid behind them. Then the pastor again issued the invitation. I felt a deep desire to be saved. I stepped out and walked to the classroom without knowing if anyone else had gone forward or not. When I got in there, I found out there were about six others uh, who were there. Pastor Cave wrote our names in his small notebook and said that he would be coming to our homes to talk further with us and our parents. He came to our house about four o'clock that following Tuesday. And... Uh, he, when he came into our home, uh, he asked me why I came forward in the invitation, and I told him I wanted to be saved. He took his New Testament and read it to me and told me how to be saved and what it meant. Satisfied with my reply, he asked my parents if they had any objection uh, to my profession of faith 
or of my being baptized. They had none. On a Sunday night, two weeks later, I was baptized. I will never forget it. I had one of the only two earaches I ever had in my life. It developed on a Friday night before I was baptized. I didn't mention to my mother and father that I had an earache for fear that they wouldn't let me be baptized, and so I just suffered through it and was baptized. That night, I ran a high fever. On one of the only days I ever knew my dad to miss any work at all, on Monday morning, he was late going to work to carry me to the doctor. We seldom went to a doctor. Oh, you know the old home remedies. And uh, back then, kerosene was refined so they didn't have lead in it. And if you stubbed your toe, anybody ever stub your toe? I've stubbed two or three on the same foot. She stubbed your toe, you go home bawling to mama, and she'd sit you down on the old back porch and pull the corn cob out of the jug with kerosene in it, pour it all over your foot, and say, Now sit there till it dries. <laughs> and if it were, had the flap on the end of the toes, you know what I mean? Uh, she would tear up an old pillow or something other than wrap my foot up uh, to help the healing process start. We hardly ever went to a doctor. I, I got a shot of penicillin that morning when I went to the doctor. When they raised the top up on that steam uh, pressure disinfectant machine that they had back then, that steam come boiling out of that thing. I thought it looked like a steam-powered grease gun. You know, they didn't, they didn't put a new needle on those things every time. They used it till it bent and you couldn't use it at all. I mean, just over and over. That thing was dull as a pencil in first grade. While the shot was being administered, I knew I'd been right about my assessment of the coming injection. After Dad had taken me home and gone on to work, I developed a serious allergic reaction to the penicillin. And uh, I developed a serious rash and my throat swelled and it was a bad situation. Crisis 2 was worse than Crisis 1. My 11-year-old brother was sent to find a relative to take me back to the doctor. I don't remember much about that when I was so sick and running such a fever and uh, I just went because I, I didn't have the energy to fight. But I remember I got another shot. Now there are many things I remember about my salvation experience and the baptismal service that followed, but one thing I remember for sure at the age of nine, I had no difficulty understanding the words of the gospel found in the authorized King James Bible regarding salvation and my need of Jesus as, as my Savior. If I had no trouble at nine years of age understanding how to be saved when it was presented in the right way, if I had no trouble understanding that, I cannot understand to save my life how anyone can say that the King James Bible is difficult to understand. It should be understandable to most anybody that has at least modest intelligence and the help of the Holy Spirit. More history. My wife and I married May the 1st, 1965. I graduated from Greenville Technical College in 1966 with an associate's degree and was called in the Army soon after graduation. God called me to preach in August 1973, and it was at once fearful and yet a thrilling experience. I enrolled at North Greenville College in January 1974. I owned, read, believed, studied, followed, trusted my authorized King James Bible. 
what I knew of God's love, grace, and mercy, I discovered from my Bible. I was delighted to learn that J.A. Cave, my old pastor of 20 years, and the man who had led me to faith in Christ, was an adjunct pa- uh, uh, professor at the school for the next couple of years, and I took every Bible course that the, the college offered during those two years, and it was a joy and a great blessing to me, and has been from the years since then. Upon my graduation from North Greenville College, I went on to two universities, earning a B.A. in religion and then on to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. But the blessing enjoyed studying the unaltered authorized version, because Pastor Cave would use nothing else, ended at North Greenville College. The universities preferred the Oxford annotated version. However, the seminary required me to use it. Not only did I find the authorized version was the Bible of choice uh, at the other denominational schools, I was appalled by the way it was dismissed and criticized at the seminary. I was startled by this discovery, disappointed, uh, in fact, uh, very put off by it. But, The standard answer the seminary gave was uh, that uh, the change to the Revised Standard Version was because it was a better text and suggested much of the Bible was myth. That was all there was to it. I'm telling you some things now that's common now and worse. Discovery of these facts were personal and challenging experiences. However, I determined to stand with authorized version, and ultimately I left the Southern Baptist Convention after graduating from seminary because the churches I was called to pastor were liberal and didn't scripturally function. The authorized version was my pulpit text, but the congregations had members in them who used other versions. Liberal pastors had weakened their authorized version position. The situation is much worse now among all mainline denominations. There doesn't seem to be much questioning from students being trained in Christian work regarding the text issue now. Other versions and liberalism seem to be a given. Bible students today largely arrive in class already indoctrinated in the critical text. 1909, when the American Standard Version uh, was presented in the United States, it was soundly rejected. Now, you get this. I'm being kind. It was because the pastors hadn't gone to seminary. And... The ones who had gone were in the minority, and the pastors told their churches to have nothing to do with that altered Bible, and it was soundly rejected. Therefore, because now that's no longer the case, there are a few questions, a few who question the wholesale abandonment of the true and unaltered received text authorized version. Bible schools now predominantly and brazenly only promote critical text Bibles. Never is there a truly balanced discussion of the issue. I went through 12 or 13 years of education. I never heard this man's name in all that time. Had I not heard him on the radio going to work while I was in school, I'd have never known there was such a person. They just dismissed the issue altogether. It was their their institutional decision, and we just had to get in line with it. Now, what I struggle through is hard for people to understand who haven't experienced it. And so I'm going to present something to you today, and I've tried to look into it to be sure that I can't be sued for this. Anyway, I'll take full responsibility. Because I don't have anything. 
And let me say to any lawyer listening, if you think you're going to get anything out of me, oh, sir, I'll give you an IOU. Anyway, I want to present a brief article just to show you how these colleges and schools and seminaries have infiltrated the minds of young people and and have presented nothing but the critical text to the preachers who are coming out and Christian workers too. And I want to give you I want to show you an, a vivid example of what I experienced and what's being given out today. I want to present a brief article taken from the June 2016 uh, issue of the Courier, the Southern South Carolina Southern Baptist Paper, which illustrates the boldness of entrenched other version teachers who now enjoy acceptance of other version position. Uh, in, in, it is brief and I present it in its entirety. It is jocular and dismissive concerning the authorized version. It supports the critical text Bible version chosen. Any of them. Whichever one you want. The authorized version isn't recommended by this leader and it's only mentioned once or twice uh, in passing. It isn't recommended uh, by this leader in uh, Baptist schools uh, and the Baptists are supporting him. This is what students and church members are being given as a standard for Bible selection. This is the way you do it. This state denominational paper, like others, is now being used to weaken church member preference for the authorized Bible. And this effort is now common in many religious publications. The title is Choosing the Best Bible Translation. Sounds very helpful. It is by Brian Cribb, Associate Pastor of Christian Studies and Chair of the Undergraduate Christian Studies in the College of Christian Studies at Anderson University. You get that down? You can take notes. Here it starts. Clemson versus USC. That's Clemson University versus University of South Carolina. Big rivalry. Coke versus Pepsi. I don't drink either one, but they tell me that this is uh, quite a hassle over that. Krispy Kreme versus Dunkin' Donut. Now, I could get in on that argument. The mere mention of such subject, now this is his words, and I'm reading his now, as I just read. The mere mention of such, such, such subjects will likely spawn spirited squabbles among South Carolina Baptists. But one topic towers above all in its potential to produce dissent and debate in the pews. No, not politics, Bible translations. Most Christians have their preference and will defend them vociferously. Some love the history and literary artistry of the King James. Mark this down. That's about the last you're going to hear about the King James Bible in this article. Others favor the fidelity and accuracy of the English Standard or New American Standard. Still others will select traditional uh, translations based on re readability such as the New International Version or the New Living Translation. For those who are honestly seeking the best translation for their own spiritual growth and nurturing, let me attempt to offer three guiding principles in finding, choosing, and using the best translations. Number one, realize that every English translation is an interpretation. Most Christians understand that the Bible was not originally written in English, but in Hebrew with some Aramaic and Greek. Therefore, any version of the Bible not in the original language is dependent on the translator to re render the sense of the text accurately. This fact should not lead Christians to doubt the reliability of their English Bibles. Indeed, most translations are produced by committees of, Bible, of biblical scholars who have studied the text much more than you or I. 
Yet the interpretive nature of the translation process should also lead us to analyze critically the available Bible translations. Who translated it? What was the translation technique and philosophy? What is the history of the translation? Is it a translation or a revision or a paraphrase? The fact that every translation is an interpretation may also inspire some to attempt to learn Greek and Hebrew, removing the veil of the translator. Yes, learning Greek and Hebrew takes time, but uh, with the number of online and printed sources available today, the goal is not unreachable. Number two, understand the particular translation technique and philosophy of each version. Reasons for choosing a particular translation should not merely include statements like, I've always used it, or I just like the way it reads. Instead, Christians should uh, base their selection on a healthy understanding of the translation technique, philosophy, and even the history behind each version. Three broad categories of each English translations exist. Now, once you get this, King James is not mentioned any, any more about these things. Three broad categories of English translations. Number one, formal or word for word, which translates uh, the words and even structures of the original languages, such as the New American Standard, Holman Christian Bible, and English Standard. Dynamic, that is, thought for thought, which translates the meaning and concepts of the original, such as the New International Version. And number three, paraphrase, which involves the rewording of the existing translation into the same language, such as the New Living Translation or the Message. Each technique attempts to balance readability with fidelity to the original text. And each will also tend to emphasize one over the other. Bible readers should be aware of the end product uh, goals of whatever version they choose. Of course, translation committees sometimes are also spurred by other motives. Uh, to use one example, the infamous today's New International Version created quite a stir a decade or two ago due to the committee's desire to eliminate gender-exclusive language uh, that, might, that uh, some might find it offensive. So a helpful exercise would be to Google the translations, find out the history and driving in, uh, interpretive philosophies behind them. And then thirdly, Use each version according to its strengths. The choice of translation might depend on one's purpose in reading and studying. If reading through a larger narrative section of Scripture, you might use a readable yet accurate paraphrase such as the New Living Translation. A paraphrase and a translation all at the same time. That's good. Uh, if choosing... If closely examining uh, the arguments of Paul and, or Jeremiah or poetic devices of the Psalms, you might consult a more formal translation like the Holman Christian Standard. For personal study of Bible texts, I advise reading the text in multiple translations. Online Bible sites and apps such as YouVersion make hundreds of translations available at, at only a click. Such comparative studies should enable the reader to see the nuances of even altered, uh, al al the alter alternate, excuse me, interpretations of the text. At the very least, reading the passage several times can't be harmful. After reading through all these translations, you might still prefer your favorite translation, but always keep in mind these others are there also. I read them in a critical and informative manner. But above all, read them. God's Word stands forever and does not return void. Uh, end of the article. As a committee of one, a longtime student of the Bible and the text issue and the pre uh, prevalent scholarly critical text devices, 
Uh, I believe that the article just read has a deeper purpose than the article's misleading claims. The article claims that it's an uh, effort to help South, Car- South Carolina Southern Baptists find the best Bible translation. However, I believe it is more truly intended to legitimize accepting any critical text Bible over the authorized version. That's what students are being taught. Now they're trying to teach the parents, you see. This article was written to South Carolina Baptists at large because there are still many Baptist parents and grandparents in South Carolina who don't accept critical text versions of the Bible instead of the authorized versions and are a great part of the financial support of the now largely apostate convention, Baptist colleges and universities. The article is an attempt to smooth the waters a bit with the denominational conservative element. The older convention members membership is the major financial supporters. Younger members are not usually as faithful in financial support. This article is also one of the intellectual sedatives used by apostate scholars to lull authorized version supporters into a Bible text sleep. Notice the long description of the author's university position. Associate Professor of Christian Studies and Chair of Undergraduate Christian Studies in the College of Christian Studies at Anderson University. And I'd like to see that printed on his door. Here is an effort to wow the reader and gain the advantage over those without the level of training the professor has. The professor doesn't even distinguish well between translation and paraphrase. Neither does he mention the consequences of altering God's Word, which new versions certainly do. The change of the underlying text from which the Bible is translated is the difference between received text and critical text. There's where the problem is. The received text is the very text handed down from the accurately preserved Old Testament and through God's New Testament writers. The received text holds God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in greater reverence and lifts and holds each member of the Trinity in greater and equal majesty than the critical text. Any person who could textually depreciate either member of the Trinity at all, as the critical text does, or can appreciate or tolerate such textual depreciation, as does the critical text versions and the call uh, that deception is, uh, is preferable, is as deceived by Satan as was Eve. Liberals seldom establish or build great institutions of learning, especially true, truly Christian Bible schools. No, liberals slither in uh, into conservative schools by means of foolish conservative administrators who think to build a great and impressive name for their school by using the so-called impressive credentials, long descriptions, of liberal teachers. The author of the foregoing article is a convinced liberal. I have a right to an opinion, at least. A truly conservative scholar would have no more opportunity of obtaining a faculty position in the religion department at Anderson University than a Jesuit Catholic priest would have had in the past becoming the school's president. The, press, the professor of the foregoing article teaches at a Southern Baptist University. Southern Baptist colleges, universities, and seminaries are funded through the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist state and national convention budgets. They therefore avoid pi, uh, financial pressure to maintain uh, loyal, uh, to remain loyal to the authorized version because members have little control over convention budget, budget fundings of the, their schools. If convention and denominational schools were supported by individual churches and support by individuals, they would be suffering from the, the, the same fate of many now liberal Bible schools which schools have been increasingly forced to close and are failing financially because 
many of their supporters are individually turning away from them due to the secretly adopted theological liberalism of Bible schools, the administrators and teachers in them, and acceptance of and promotion of altered Bible versions. And to some of you educated people who are listening to this tonight, and I hope you are, I know a run-on sentence when I hear one, but it's a go-on statement. I can't tell you how disgusted I am with the situation being supported by Christians who have to depend upon the people that they place their trust in who have betrayed them and now are suffering because of it. The once spiritually strong, biblically biblically founded conservative churches of America and England and their authorized version loving people and pastors are nearly all gone. So too are the other mainline authorized version conservative denominations. The rampant sin infesting all conservative authorized version churches and schools have the same direct cause. Powerless preaching from a compromised Bible by pastors who will not accept their responsibility of facing their congregation with the unaltered words of God and say with conviction, Thus saith the Lord! One of the primary reasons pastors are becoming muted is due to the fact that they have little confidence in their Bible. They have been lured away from the true words of God, and it shows. As the above article demonstrates, believers are becoming duped by liberal scholars. Redeeming faith must be grounded in the words of God. Any altered Bible version is a compromise of God's truth. At this point in time, according to the Internet information, there are 233 English translations of the Bible, with the exception exception of the authorized version and perhaps one other, I don't know, maybe. All are are, are new text versions, critical text versions, and only the authorized version is trustworthy. Remember... In order to obtain a new version copyright, there must be at least a 200 word change of the text. If one multiplies 232, the authorized version would be the 233rd, uh, multiply 232 times 200 words, there is revealed that in modern versions there are a total of at least 46,400 word changes. How one may be saved from sin and hell is seriously distorted, uh, and eternity will be long to the sufferer for whom, for who, for those who are misled by their faulty salvation belief based on an altered text and claim a false hope that isn't scripturally based upon repentance of sin and true faith in the risen Christ. Eternity will also reveal what the eternal cost to humanity will be due to the critical text altered biblical truth regarding redeeming faith increasingly being promoted, preached, and believed. The English authorized translation of the Hebrew words of God commanded Adam to, uh, commanded Adam to obey were a mere 39 words. It wasn't 39 words in Hebrew, but it's 39 words in the translated English. It's a big argument to say in seminary that the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, had a language, that they had a written language in Hebrew. Uh, no, no, no. They, did, they got it from somewhere else. They didn't, didn't get it from God. Uh, they had Hebrew. And, and they had a Bible. God gave it to them. But when it began, the first Bible, the first Bible had 39 words in it. 
Satan's questioning of Eve regarding the words God had spoken revealed that she didn't precisely know what God had said in the 39-word Bible. Satan seized upon Eve's addition of the words, Neither shall ye touch it, and established his basis for condemnation of God's veracity and honor. Adam, foolish man that he was, like my, uh, modern Bible scholars, didn't insist upon obeying the words God had spoken to him. Just as carelessly as Adam allowed Satan through deception and guile to ruin him through the influence of Eve by her lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life, so too is he using apostate scholars' efforts to replace the received authorized version with the new critical versions, with all with the same deadly consequences. Redeeming faith is quickly becoming hard to find in the Bibles, and the words have altered uh, the theology of the doctrine of salvation. And many in these critical text churches have a better chance of going to heaven by accidentally running in to an authorized version uh, witness out on the street than they do in one of these churches or by them coming by their house and giving them a, a, a witness. All right. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll give you a little something extra. If you have a Bible, turn with me, please, to Psalm 119. I want to read with you. Stand together, if you will, please, if you can. I understand that, that some of you are, are suffering fairly much. Uh, Psalm 119, beginning at verse 41. Let thy mercies come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hope in thy judgments. So shall I keep thy law to me in ever and ever and ever. Yeah. Uh, verse 45, I will walk in the, in the liberty of thy, for I seek thy precepts. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings, and will not be ashamed. I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. My hands I lift up unto the commandments, which I have loved, and will meditate in the statutes. Paul's out for the stumbling, but with diabetes, it's very hard to see the text. Thank you so much. Okay, you may be seated. Thank you, Pastor Randy. Appreciate that. I'm going to ask. Uh, Pastor Spencer to come up and invite us to the special refreshments back in the back. But before we do, there's one other question that's come in. Uh, Pastor Daniel Wade has given us a summary. Uh, in the second session, 14 have visited our sermon audio streaming, six being the greatest number. Bible Free Baptist Church, we've had a total of 19, speaking of 17, several from the USA watching, and one in each in Canada, Brazil, and Australia. The YouTube saw between 6 and 11 viewers, with the numbers frequently being between 9 and 10. Thus, for the second session, we estimate between 25 and 45 viewers out there on the Internet. And uh, we had six speakers today. We have nine more tomorrow. I'll be sure to be promptly tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. Breakfast is being served. Uh, Pastor, uh, you want to give us an invitation? Breakfast is served anytime from 7.30 on, I believe. So come for breakfast and lunch and supper. Okay, go ahead, Pastor. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Well, after a great day like that, all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. You are invited, all of you, for some refreshments out in the lobby immediately following this time together. Then tomorrow morning, you all are invited, uh, no matter who you are, from where you are, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, the ladies have prepared a lot of wonderful things for us for tomorrow as well. I know I had to use my big blue van, this is a 15-passenger van, to make three or four trips with loads of food. So please, help us to eat that. And uh, so we are delighted to have you with us. And uh, Brother Waite, you going to close in prayer? Okay, let's, let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for the power of your word. Thy word is truth. 
And Father, we thank you that in your mercy and grace you have reached down to us in our sinful condition and drawn us to Christ through the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We thank you. Father, we thank you for the privilege of the freedom that we have in this country. Evaporating it appears, but nonetheless we still are free. And inside we are free regardless of what men do to us on the outside. We pray that you might help us to make good use of the time that's been entrusted to us, that each one of us would be faithful day by day in our testimony, our faithful witness for Jesus Christ, our standing for the word of God. And Father, we pray for your blessings on each as they travel to their various locations tonight for rest, that you'll help us to sleep soundly, to be back here tomorrow morning, eager and alert to hear more of that which is true, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join us for refreshments in the back.